Great, let's go ahead um, and uh, kick off uh, this uh, part of the OITE series on the mental health and well being of the biomedical research community. Let me uh, start by thanking you all uh, for being here today, or actually, I guess yesterday, kicked off uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. And of course, what we'd like to do in terms of culture change within our community is make every month Mental Health Awareness Month and sort of empower each and every one of us to take good care of ourselves and to work uh, in community to take good care of each other. You know, not uh, surprisingly, um, I'll share just a little bit of data from a recent work health survey uh, that comes out of the me of Mental Health America. And it starts by saying rates of stress and distraction remain high across all workplaces, right? Not a big surprise. Uh, we work in a really intense uh, high knowledge environment all of the time, and we are all grappling with so much uh, that has happened in our lives and within uh, the country, within the world. Uh, we watch, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, issues unfold, uh, violence and war, uh, climate change disasters, I, you know, a lot. And in the midst of all of this, we try to do really good work. It's not surprising that uh, we're all distracted and that, uh, that we're all stressed. The thing is that that stress leads to issues with our ability to attend to what we need to attend to. And today we're going to talk about executive functioning, the intersection of our executive functioning, our well-being, our health, our mental health. And I think this is a great uh, discussion to have right now for Mental Health Awareness Month, but it's also a great discussion to have right now because we have 500 plus summer interns joining the NIH community soon. Here we have turnover in our post back community, lots of new people uh, joining. And it's really nice for those of us who are um, mentors and advisors and supervisors to think some about how we can support our trainees in finding uh, strategies uh, for a high level of executive function. We're uh, going to be led today in the talk by Lori Jacob McNulty. Many of you know Lori from the Resilient Science Training Program, from lots of groups for PIs and staff scientists. Uh, she is going to give a talk, take some questions, and then uh, for all of you interested, we'll uh, hop off this Zoom, hop on another Zoom, uh, and have some facilitated uh, small group discussions. So Lori, you take it from here. And for all of you here, um, welcome, and I hope that it's a really great hour or two. All right, thank you, Sharon. Um, so I'm really glad that we're all here today. Um, you know, like Sharon was saying, executive functioning is something that we all are struggling with, all are dealing with to varying degrees. And so it's something that, you know, we have our strengths and our needs, and I'm hopeful that we'll, able, we'll each be able to sort of have um, some identification with both your strengths and your needs of executive functioning um, as we go through the talk today. So I just want to give a little bit, start with a little bit of background um, that might look familiar to you, but um, Harvard, dubs executive functioning as sort of the air traffic control system of the brain. And really, I think instead of saying sort of what is executive functioning, the, the best way to think about it is it's a set of skills, right, that's housed in our prefrontal cortex that really lets us perform at a high level and lets us think in that sort of uniquely human future planning, um, abstract thought kind of a way. Um, so just so um, you're aware, executive functioning in the prefrontal cortex, that's part of our brain continues to grow into our mid 20s. So think about yourself or people that you work with or people in your family or your friends, this part of the brain is still growing and developing. And this is not to say that, you know, once you hit your mid 20s, you've sort of hit your cap with this, right? This is something that we can always be developing. But just in terms of architectural brain growth, um, this continues to keep moving until the 20 into our mid 20s. 
So for the skills that I'm just going to go through each of these and talk a little bit about them. And I'm sure as we talk about them, probably all of them really apply to work in biomedical research. So, you know, planning, thinking through projects, thinking through articles, thinking through teams that you're going to be on, really having a plan, both short term planning of what's this day, this week, this experiment going to look like to longer term plans and sort of how does this fit into the context of the current research. So really planning is a huge piece of it, as well as prioritizing. And you'll notice that a lot of these go hand in hand. We're not often using one executive functioning without using most of them at the same time. So prioritizing is a huge piece of planning. And that's something I work a lot um, with the biomedical researchers that I work with on is prioritizing, right? I know that I have this plan, but it's really hard for me to figure out what comes first and how do I do this and how do I pick what's most important or what's most urgent and it because it all often feels urgent. Um, organizing, um, right, is we often think about our our environment being organized, our desk, our bench, our space being organized, our papers, but also there's a mental component to organizing. It's organizing our thoughts, right? How is it that I'm going to think through this entire um, process? Or how is it that I'm going to sort of organize all of the things that I need to do in the day and sort of keep track of everything and not get distracted? So organization is a big piece. And uh, just so you know, sort of towards uh, the hopefully the last two thirds or the last half will be strategies for supporting all of these um, executive functioning um, skills. Time management is another piece of the puzzle, right? That always there are a lot of things going on, right? Both work and professionally. So how do we manage our time and make sure things are getting done in a timely manner and they're not sort of going unnoticed or also not taking so long, um, but also not being shortchanged. Flexible thinking is a big um, piece of the puzzle that this incorporates both um, saying, okay, well, this plan isn't working. How do I change? How do I shift? How do I think flexibly and move to plan B, E, C, D, Z? Uh, but also flexible thinking and seeing things from multiple perspectives, including taking perspectives from collaborators and colleagues and other people. Um, so flexible thinking can be a really important one in your work, as well as working memory. And there's a lot of different kinds of memory and people who are much more expert than I, but I like to think of working memory as the ability to hold the information in your mind and manipulate it at the same time. Right? So knowing that, okay, well, I, I ran this data yesterday and that kind of meant this, and so I can manipulate it this way today and I could try that, right? It's sort of, I think of it as the memory that's on the table at the moment. Um, which includes holding in your, your mind what your plans are for the day um, and manipulating that information. Emotion regulation is also an executive function that sometimes we overlook or we don't sort of think about how important that is, but anything that we care about is going to make us feel emotions. So when we care about our work, um, especially in the context of our broader lives, there's going to have to be some emotion regulation, acknowledging our emotions, um, being aware of them, um, figuring out sort of what they mean in the context of what's going on in our work, but not getting too stuck in them. So we're going to talk about that a little bit in more detail of emotion regulation. Then there's self-control and inhibition. That's stopping ourselves from doing something. So that can be probably usually is can be tied up with emotion regulation, right? Stop pulling ourselves back and saying, hey, is this something that I need to be doing right now and sort of stopping ourselves? But it's also stopping ourselves when we're in the middle of something and we think, oh yeah, I got to do that other thing. It's stopping and saying, okay, but I'm doing this right now, so I can't just run off to that. So inhibition is a big one, as well as self-monitoring, checking in, how am I doing? Um, how, what's going well? What's not going well? Where do I need to shift? And then these next three, task completion, sustained effort, and task initiation, that's right, task initiation is getting started. I think I hear a lot, I'm okay once I get started, but I can't get myself to get going. Sustained effort is keeping going, even when it gets boring or challenging, is sort of pushing through that, and task completion is seeing it through to the end. And then in all of these, we need problem solving and decision making, right? Because that's a huge part of science is, this isn't working, I need to shift, I need to change what's next. Um, so there's some debate if attention is an executive functioning or, or just um, you know, very close to it, but 
there's a bunch of different kinds of attention. And I do think, you know, we talked, I already talked a little bit about attention span, sort of pushing through and um, continuing to attend to something, even when it's challenging, so our attention span. But I think executive attention is often what we're thinking about when we're thinking about um, executive functioning is regulating our responses and making choices about what to attend to. So the Stroop test, I think, is a very nice way to think about it. So if you look at the bottom left corner, and I said, what color is that? You might have to make an effort to say it's red instead of just saying it's green, right? So choosing, making choices about what to attend to, that can be a part of executive functioning and, and it can be challenging as well. I think it's really important, you know, as we started off this talk talking about Mental Health Awareness Month, that mental health and wellness and executive functioning are often a cyclical process. And I'm gonna repeat this a few times today, but that, our executive functioning is impacted by our wellness and our mental health pretty intensely and sort of vice versa, right? We know that targeting um, executive functioning skills can improve our wellness, our mental health, our emotional behavior, our physical health, right? They can lead to feelings of more sense of control, more sense of life satisfaction. And at the same time, targeting our wellness and our mental health taking care of that part of ourselves can help improve our executive functioning. We're going to talk a little bit more about this dynamic um, in the next couple of slides, but just think about that in a cyclical way. There's an Arnstein article that it's kind of, it's a little old now, but it's a really nice sort of mouse model where it, you know, thinks about that stress, especially uncontrollable acute stress, can cause this rapid loss in prefrontal cognitive abilities. And even prolonged exposure to stress right, can even create architectural changes in the brain. Right? So if we think about where the executive functioning is housed, then this stress can really impact that part of the brain and that executive functioning. Um, when we are stressed, just for a little bit of perspective, our brain switches from a sort of a top down perspective where we're using our top down we're using this part of our brain. Um, there's more reality testing there's more error monitoring right we're we're guiding our attention and thought we're inhibiting inappropriate behavior we're regulating our emotions. When we become stressed our amygdala, amygdala will take over that's where we hear about our fight flight freeze fawn response we no longer are sort of operating from that prefrontal cortex. We are more operating from a place of stress um, and um, reflexes. So it's important to sort of think about that as we talk about emotion regulation and coping, we're gonna talk about ways to sort of calm our bodies down so that we can bring that, um, that um, prefrontal cortex back online. Executive functioning is, tightly linked to a multitude of factors. I do not want to sort of skip over that there are um, particular mental health diagnoses that are associated with um, more needs with executive functioning, um, as well as neurodiversity, right, brings its own executive functioning needs. So I just, I want to highlight that, as well as stress, multiple competing demands. The more demands you have, right, the harder it is, the harder your executive functioning has to be working. This includes working in a fast paced, high achieving environment. Um, it also includes having unrealistic expectations can tax our executive function. Um, the other thing that is really important to sort of note is that our general well being taxes our executive functions. Think about sort of how well are you problem solving and planning and prioritizing when you haven't slept or you haven't eaten or all you're running on is coffee or you feel isolated and lonely or your physical health is off right all of these things impacted um, just to be aware we have neurodiversity coffee chats um, sort of if that's something that you're interested in um, we will have one in mid-may um, and um, that information can be found sort of on the oit website but that's also something if you're interested in, particularly talking about executive functioning and neurodiversity, that's a, a resource as well. So I like to think of executive functioning as an iceberg, right? Oftentimes we see executive functioning issues and we feel like, oh, that person's always late or I can never be on time or I make all of these charts and calendars and yet I'm not following through on anything. So we see these executive functioning issues show up at work 
and then we're not necessarily seeing the underlying concerns. We think, oh, well, I just need a better alarm or a better app or a better calendar, right? But there's underlying mental health and wellness concerns, right? So it's really important to avoid making assumptions. We gotta look at the whole picture. We're gonna talk a little bit about how to do that, but a precursor to that is using self-compassion, right? This is key when we work on executive functioning skills, because I think executive functioning is one of those things that tends to bring more embarrassment or more shame. We feel like I should just be able to do this. Everyone else can get to work on time or everyone else knows where their stuff is or look at this organized space that I see on the internet and why can't I do this? And so we often lose self-compassion when we're talking about executive functioning issues. So it's critical to sort of maintain that, like this is that everyone has strengths and needs in these areas and that working towards it um, is really aided by self-compassion. So the question then is like where to start, right? If there's this whole iceberg of stuff, um, we kind of will tend to go towards quick fixes. Do you need a better alarm? Do you need a better planning sheet? And sometimes those are really helpful, right? And they do the trick, but we don't wanna miss core issues. So if task initiation is an executive function that you're struggling with, and the thought is, well, I just can't get started. Well, maybe the answer is, do I need to set a timer? Or maybe the answer is something um, like, do I need to address this unhelpful thought I'm having that if I start this project, I'm gonna fail, right? They both look like struggles with task initiation, but the root that under the iceberg is very different. So we want to be curious. There's some curiosity questions that you can ask yourself. I'm not gonna read through all of them because I wanna to get to the strategies, but think about these questions, right? You'll have the, the recorded in the slides to sort of think about these questions of what are those things that might be under the iceberg? What are the mental health, health issues? Is this changing for me? Or is this something that's always been a part of, of um, my learning needs? Am I operating from this bottom up perspective, right? Where um, I am just reacting out of fight, flight, freeze, and fawn? Or am I really using my, um, am I using my prefrontal cortex? And if I'm not, what might be going on? What might be stressing me out? Right, so thinking about sort of asking yourself some of these questions. So we're going to start, I'm going to go through each of those skills that we talked about at the beginning. But I really want to reiterate that addressing our overall wellness has to be sort of a constant thing. In addition to sort of picking out these each of these skills and working on each of these skills, but talking about our overall wellness is always going on um, in the foreground, in the background. So thinking about, are there mental health issues that may be impacting your executive functioning? Maybe particularly, is there anxiety? Could there be depression or stress? Is there some avoidance or numbing? Sometimes when we are really overwhelmed and stressed and our well, we're not taking care of our wellness, we start to avoid things, right? Which looks like poor task initiation, poor time management, poor planning, right? But really there's something else going on there. Are we afraid of disappointing others or is there a fear of perfectionism? I think perfectionism is associated often with this person who works and works and works and works until everything's just right. But there is um, often a version of perfectionism where we feel like if it's not perfect, I can't do it and we become sort of paralyzed. And then that looks like executive functioning issues. That looks like you're not prioritizing, you're not getting started, you're not sustaining an effort, you're not completing tasks. When in reality, there's these all these underlying stressors, including perfectionism, imposter fears, cognitive distortions, so a characteristic unhelpful thoughts like catastrophizing or all or nothing thinking, I either has to be perfect or I can't get started as well as the fear of making wrong decisions and assertiveness fears, which I really want to bring up here. There is often, I think, an executive function. What looks like poor executive functioning or struggles with executive functioning is the fear of being assertive, saying to somebody, listen, this project seems really interesting and I'm so excited about it, but I can't fit it on my plate right now. Or is there a little bit of it I could do? Or could I help with this small chunk right now? Um, when we, um, when we um, think about assertiveness, right? 
if we just say, yeah, 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 that's fine, I'll do that, and then we never get it done, then people think, oh, what's going, right, what's going on, or we feel like, oh, what's going on, why can't I do this, so thinking about assertiveness, and um, there's also, um, Sharon will be a, uh, doing an assertiveness lecture on Thursday, and you can email her if you want to sort of join in on that and think about um, more specific skills on building assertiveness. So let's go through the executive functions while all of that overall wellness and taking care of ourselves. I'm going to talk a little bit about taking care of our whole selves as well at the end, but taking care of ourselves is going on. Let's start thinking about the specific executive functioning, the spe specific executive functioning skills. So prioritizing. So it can be really helpful to triage our tasks. What's important and urgent? What's important and not urgent and what's unimportant and not urgent so you know maybe this doesn't feel so important and you don't have to do it right now but you know it's something that has to be done so starting to triage when you look at what am how do i prioritize what i need to do starting to do that triage where i find people get tripped up most of the time we can figure out oh you know what this is important this is not so important not always but but most of the time we can figure out what's important it's the urgency thing that trips us up Oftentimes people I'm working with will say like, it all feels important. I got to get it all done. It's all in the name of this project or this grant. How do I know if it's urgent or not? So asking ourselves some questions. Is it time sensitive? Do you have limited time with equipment or materials that you have? Listen, you've only got this thing for three more weeks. Um, is it something maybe that would have a negative impact if it's not done today or this week or this month or this year? So starting to ask those questions about um, negative impacts if you're not getting it done. What about deadlines? Sometimes urgency isn't coming from us. Sometimes urgency is coming from our collaborators or our superiors. So really starting to say, okay, what are the questions I can ask myself to determine if this is urgent? That will help me start to prioritize. Another thing that gets in the way of prioritizing is cognitive distortions. So unhelpful, characteristically negative thoughts that you can go back and we talked about cognitive distortions in depth in the anxiety talk, which is on our YouTube channel. But things like catastrophizing, this is gonna be the worst thing ever. Terrible things are gonna happen if I don't get this done mind reading, oh, they're going to be so mad if I don't get this done, or all or nothing thinking, right, it has to be perfect. So or I have to pick the absolute top priority to even get started. So examining our cognitive distortions helps us with prioritizing because we can say, okay, is this realistic? Or is this unhelpful? And, and maybe not such a realistic way of thinking about things. Prioritizing also, there's a lot going on, we're kind of turning, turning, trying to figure out what to do first. So give your working memory a break and write things down, right? If you can sort of write down all of the things, then it helps us see things. I think oftentimes we try to keep this in our mind. And maybe for some people that gets really overwhelming to see it all written down and there's another strategy, like talking about it with somebody else can be helpful. But it's also important to sort of not rely totally on keeping it all, trying to keep it all in your mind if that gets overwhelming. It's also okay to take breaks when we're prioritizing. When we're trying to solve a problem, we need to take breaks. And there's going to be some of these things that you're going to see come up again and again, right? Because they'll be helpful and taking breaks is one of them. The last thing is to get support. It's really important when we're prioritizing to not have to do it all alone. And get support is going to be on every one of these slides. And if it's not, it's because it, it should be. Because a lot of these things, we need help. There's formal support where you can go to a colleague or you can have a formal meeting or you could get, you know, mental health support. There's also informal support. Hey, I'm having this conundrum and I don't quite know where to start. Can you help me prioritize? With right along with prioritizing goes planning. So it helps to divide, you know, into time periods. Like what's my plan for today? What's my plan for this week, this month, this year? Sort of helping these things kind of fit together in a bigger picture can really help us with planning and prioritizing. Okay, I guess I don't really have to do this right now. This can be in six months. But it's where we tend to get tripped up with planning is being realistic. How much of it is um, realistic when we make our plans? How long do things historically take? Oftentimes um, in the mental health world, we say that one of the um, a helpful way to think about what will happen in the future is to think about what happened in the past. So how long does this historically take? And what else do you have going on both inside and outside of work, right? You have 
a family to attend to, you have a whole life, right? So really, maybe this will only take eight hours, but mixed in with everything else that's going on, maybe this will take a week to, to accomplish. And be realistic and self-compassionate about that. And are there other competing demands? Like I said, you know, maybe your group only has equipment for one for a period of time, or maybe you only have a certain time, amount of time with the material, or maybe because of lab schedules, you only are in on certain days or research group schedules. So thinking about what other competing demands, like really thinking through the pieces of the puzzle here, rather than, okay, well, this one thing takes me this much time. Again, not relying on memory alone, using apps and lists and alarms, really um, using tools, right? Not having to keep it all in your mind. Another piece of planning that can be really helpful is creating routines, right? When we have to plan for every little thing, what are we gonna have for lunches the next day? What am I gonna wear the next day? Do I, how do, I have to have to do my laundry, all of these like extra little things that even outside of work, um, if we create routines like every, you know, every day I'm going to eat this for lunch this week, right? If we just create a routine, it takes the burden of planning our cognitive load away from that. And if there's things that you routinize, then that can be really useful. So every, you know, I always right at this time or you know i try to set this time aside for doing my correspondence and my emails so routinizing can be helpful again I'm, you're going to hear me say self-compassion quite a bit i think that we think that planning looks a certain way often right i gotta get this particular planner that i see online or that my colleague uses and i or i gotta plan it in this particular way that my colleague tends to plan right plans don't have to look one way they just have to work for you right? They just have to be a, something that's functional for you and helps you. So not getting sort of caught up in what it should look like, but just what does it look like? And where do you find yourself getting tripped up? Also plans change. We're going to talk about thinking flexibly. Plans can change and they're going to change, right? It's not a if when plans change, it's a when. So plans change and sort of being self-compassionate um, and, and not harsh about that can be really useful. So while we're planning, because plans change, right? <laughs> Things require problem solving and decision making, constant problem solving um, in the scientific field. This is working, this isn't working, this isn't what I thought it would be. There's this collaboration isn't what I would hope for. There's lots of problem solving and decision making. And this list um, is useful when you're thinking through a problem that you need to solve or a decision that you need to make. It's not um, all encompassing but I do think it's a nice thing. And oftentimes when we have executive functioning needs, it's hard to think through each little step. Sometimes we get too lost in the bigger picture and sometimes we get too stuck in the details. So this is a nice thing to sort of create sort of a medium ground. What's really going on in this problem that I need to solve? So thinking about identifying issues, determining what are the steps that I need to take? What are my goals that I have for this? And then what are the pathways I have to get to those goals? Can I incorporate the views of other people that are involved, right? That's always a part of problem solving. Usually we are not doing any work in a vacuum. So incorporating the views of others and then prioritizing our actions, taking actions, assessing and monitoring how did that go, attending to our internal state, right? So how is this going? How is this feeling? What's going on with my emotion regulation? What's going on with my stress? Sort of attending to all of those things throughout the process and then seeking support, right? This is not something that is expected to happen alone. So when we're going through each of those, it can help when we figure out hmm, which one of these things do I tend to get stuck on, right? Can I not come up with the goals? Do I even sort of know what the issue is? Is it hard for me to assess sort of how things are going once I do take action? Is it hard to start? Is it hard to sustain? So thinking about, each one of these steps or multiple steps often get us tripped up. So think about where is it, right, that we're getting tripped up, but also where is it that we're feeling the most stress and anxiety? So attending to ourselves, that's that internal state, 
it's really stressful for me. I can sort of think of all the pathways. It becomes really stressful to pick a route, right? Without sort of checking with everyone I know, or I really need help picking a route, but the stress is I don't wanna ask anybody for that help because that shows that I don't know what I'm doing. So think about where it is that you're getting tripped up in this process and then support yourself in those areas. So the support can look like journaling, right? It can look like internal reflection. It can look like journaling being, you know, writing things out but also sort of internal, like stopping and giving yourself some time to think about it. it, can also look like external support, discussing it with trusted others. So that could be colleagues, friends, family, therapists, talking with trusted others about this decision-making process. Self-compassion, again, pretty key. Creating alternative plans, right? Maybe I'm really, really worried that this isn't gonna work, but if I have, two other plans. Maybe I won't feel so stuck that this way has to be the way. And then taking breaks, right? When we are problem solving, we need breaks. We can't get so, so stuck in the details and stuck in the weeds that we're not really getting any other input or calm and whatever breaks look like to you. We'll talk about some ways to sort of take healthy breaks. There's a few more of this, um, you know, for problem solving and decision making, thinking about, um, our mental health needs, our anxieties, our well-being, reasonable expectations. You know, you're going to see these again and again because they're so intertwined um, and incorporating a lot of the skills we already talked about for prioritizing and planning. When we think about organization, right, we think about physical space. And there's just, you know, I think there's so much in the world, especially in pop culture right now, about organizing our physical space. There's Netflix shows and there's Instagram and there's all of these things. What I want to say about this, there's two key parts of this, I think, for physical space. One is um, creating sustainable systems. So do something that sort of uh, fits already into your life, right? You don't have to start a whole new system that you're gonna have to work really hard to maintain. It's not gonna quite work for you, that you know doesn't quite feel right. So if you have a place where you come and you put your stuff, maybe just put a bowl there. Right. And then every day you can put your stuff in the bowl. Right. So at least you kind of always know where it is, but not sort of creating brand new systems unless they feel right to you. And the second piece is I do think that the self-compassion is important in organization because there is a lot of content now about physical organization that can lead us feeling like oh, if I was a better person, if I was um, if I just tried a little harder, things would be a little more organized. And it's really important that things feel right to you and that, that you can be flexible and you can change them as you need to. Mental organization, I think, is an important one as well. Oftentimes I'll hear people say like, well, I got started on one thing, but then I put that down and I went to this next thing and then I went to the next thing and I didn't know what I was doing for the first thing. So sort of keeping yourself mentally organized can be really helpful. So again, using your wellness tools um, to keep your whole self well can sort of help with some mental organization, but also using external systems, right? Not relying totally on keeping everything in your working memory. And I just I want to mention that oftentimes when I'm working on this with people, I, I notice and we discuss that there's a lot of resistance often. Okay, well, I'll start this, but like, I don't think it's going to be helpful or like, I don't really want to do that or I don't really. So just acknowledging what's going on with you with your resistance, maybe to some of these things and taking a look at that, right? Whether that's, you know, I've tried this 10 times before and every time I try it, it doesn't work and I feel like a failure or yeah, it doesn't really work in my life. I don't really have time for that. So just acknowledging your resistance can sort of help you figure out hmm, what's working and what's not working. The other piece of the puzzle of mental organization is know your times and places. So if you asked me at nine o'clock at night to sort of organize a talk for the next day, I mean, I could do it, but it would be hard and it would be really taxing. There'd be a lot of cognitive load. But if you asked me at 10 o'clock after I had coffee and been outside and had breakfast, I, I think my mental organization would be a little better. So sort of know what's going on. If you're it's four o'clock and your kids are running around, that maybe isn't the best time for mental organization. The next piece sort of as we're thinking about all of these that I've been sort of alluding to is remaining flexible. And I really think that this is an important one to kind of touch on because when we care deeply about things, when we have heightened emotions, when we feel anxious or afraid, it is really, really hard to be flexible, right? Oftentimes we find comfort 
in control. And so when we are having a lot of strong emotions, when we are feeling worried, when we care, um, you know, there comes a point where we struggle to be flexible. That's probably when we need to be the most flexible. So what can be really helpful is sort of focusing on the pieces that we can control. And this is if you've been to any of these talks, you've probably seen this diagram, you know, uh, adapted from our colleague Kelly Donahue. The, um, the thing that can sort of keep us not so flexible and more rigid is sticking with this, really trying to control the things we can't or the things we wish we could, but we can't. And by focusing on what we can control, that's what helps us with our flexibility. Even if the thing we can control is, okay, I'm going to start doing plan B or I'm going to sit down and have a hard conversation with somebody, um, or I'm going to sort of try to slow down and incorporate what other people are telling me about my project. So being flexible, often thinking about, well, what's really in my control? And again, managing our well-being, right? Focusing on that anxiety, focusing on those heightened emotions, figuring out what they mean and sort of, um, processing them can help us with flexibility. Um, working memory, again, um, I think this one is often a little bit more concrete, right? These sort of classic breaking down tasks, setting reminders, setting alarms, creating calendars, checklists, right? Like getting on, getting on the same page as our support systems. Um, working memory, oftentimes, I will say like, um, put it down somewhere, right? Write it down somewhere. So it's not sort of constantly worrying in your mind. Um, I think that we can get sort of stuck with too many systems, too many lists, too many apps. So maybe just starting with one can be a useful um, tool here. Then there is task initiation. So this is the getting started part. And this is often what I hear, especially when there's a lot of stress. I just can't get started. I'm so worried that it's going to be so hard or I'm going to feel like a failure or it's going to not work, right? So really thinking about the stressors when it comes to task initiation, not just, oh, I just can't get started. It also helps to find our motivation. Why am I doing this? But we don't want to rely on motivation alone to get started, right? Because if we wait till we start to feel like we're, we start to feel like doing something, so there's some things we probably are never going to feel like doing, right? If you're not a paperwork person and you have to do a bunch of paperwork and you got to get it done in order to get your grant or, or just, you know, the normal paperwork that comes with being a scientist, then yeah, there's some things you might not feel like doing. Um, so for those things, creating routines, incorporating rewards and breaks. Okay, I'm always going to do my paperwork. And maybe I'm using paperwork as an example, because that is the thing for me that I never truly felt super motivated to do, right. But I think the, the idea of okay, well, I'm going to do my paperwork, I always do it on Friday mornings for these three hours, and then there is a reward, right. So those that can be helpful, or then there's a break, or then I'm going to go outside and I'm going to go for a walk. Right? Um, it helps to just dis decrease distractions, right? If there's something that is not motivating to do, sort of putting yourself in a position where um, you have that sort of quiet and reduced distraction. And setting clear expectations is really helpful for task initiation with yourself. Okay, this is when I'm going to get started on this. And I, maybe it doesn't have to be the whole thing. Maybe it's, I'm just going to get started on this tiny piece of it to get myself rolling. But also with those around you, right? when somebody says, hey, I need you to do this, it's okay to set some clear expectations of, hey, when do you need this by? Or um, I'm really slammed this week. Is it okay if I wait to start this next Monday? Self-monitoring, we're going to talk about self-monitoring. Um, but this is sort of how's it going with my getting started on things. And really, again, acknowledge and explore that avoidance and resistance that you're feeling. Because if you can say, okay, you know, I, I know I have to do this thing, but I just I can't, I can't seem to get myself started. Where is that coming from rather than just even avoiding the feeling of resistance? And again, some accountability can be helpful, even if it's, hey, I have a huge meeting um, at nine o'clock. Can you text me to make sure that I'm awake? Sustained effort, right? So this is once you do get started, how do you sustain that, right? Again, there's 
an overall well-being to component to it, right? It can be hard to keep going on things, especially when they're difficult. If you've got a lot of other things going on or mental health needs, or you have a lot of anxiety, there's a physical self-care, right? Sustained effort also means that our bodies have to be um, well-nourished and taken care of too. Are we sleeping? Are we eating nutritiously? Are we exercising? Are we going outside? Um, we need some realistic expectations in sustained effort, like, oh, well, this was great and easy when I started, but now it's hard, so that must mean something's not working. Is that so? Is that realistic? Or is it just that sometimes these, a lot of the work that we're doing or that you're doing is more challenging? What's the realistic expectations? There's, you know, so you're gonna see these similar things again and again about breaks and rewards and timers, right? But I think, you know, sort of the, other piece of the puzzle is combating boredom. How do you break this up? What do you do when it's boring? How do you persevere when it's boring? Does that mean that you only do a little bit at a time? Does that mean that you check in with somebody else and use support systems? Like, how are you managing that boredom? But that can come if something is feeling tedious and you're struggling, which is often um, comes up with executive functioning needs. Um, and we're gonna talk about distractions and hyperfocus um, in a few on, during time management too. Impulse control and response inhibition is a big one. So this is how do you get yourself to sort of pull back um, and, and not do something. So whether that's, hey, I'm in the middle of something and I want to go do something else, or even, hey, I'm really frustrated and I want to act on this frustration in the moment. This is a really um, helpful kind of uh, visual that I print out and often have in my offices. So to stop, take a breath, open your mind and review your options, like you could yell back at somebody or you could sort of get distracted and go and do another thing but what are the choices that you have in that moment and then pick one that feels right to you um, and so this is i think a useful thing it helps when you think about this when you're calm because oftentimes there's places where we struggle with inhibition and so to say okay this is a time that usually gets me mad or this is a time where i usually kind of veer off course mm -hmm. what can i what are my um how can I alert myself to that's happening and I need to use the stop? So a big piece of um, all of this really, including inhibition, is emotion regulation. So I like to think about emotion regulation in the, I, the realm of relax, distract, and cope. So if relax is sort of that helping our brains calm down, helping us go from a top down rather than a bottom up, calming our nervous system. So that could be deep breathing, grounding exercises to sort of help us bring back to the current moment. And there's um, meditation groups. Um, and um, in the previous executive functioning talks, I went into in more detail um, and anxiety talks, I went into more detail about grounding exercises. So really anything that you need to do to sort of calm that body down, because that's what's gonna help us bring our executive functioning back online. And then there's distraction, right? There's healthy, helpful ways um, of distracting ourselves, taking breaks. We want to be careful that we don't veer into numbing, which is total avoidance and just sort of getting stuck in a loop and binge watching TV for hours and hours. And I think a good way to kind of recognize that is when we're done with distraction, are we feeling better or are we feeling worse? If we're feeling worse, we might be veering into numbing. But you know, if you read a chapter, two chapters, of a book, right? Or if you get outside for an hour, does that help you feel recharged? And then coping, it is um, managing and sort of processing and dealing with those emotions. So that can be look like journaling, it can be talking to someone about the issue, a family, um, a friend, a mentor, recognizing and appreciating unhelpful thoughts and talking back with more realistic thoughts. So on the YouTube channel, there's a the cognitive distortion and imposter fears goes into depth about sort of ways to help manage and talk back to our unhelpful thoughts, making a plan and addressing the issue, moving towards acceptance. Okay, this is upsetting to me and I'm disappointed in this. What is it that I can do about it? And also sort of accessing resources, of professional health therapy and medication, which we'll talk about a little bit at the end as well. 
Then there's time management um, as we sort of wrap up the last couple of, of executive functions. So understanding our personal strengths and struggles. So there's actually supplemental sessions to this. Um, and in I think on Thursday of this week, we're going to be talking about executive functioning skills. And we'll talk more in depth about time management, but really thinking about what, where is it that I get tripped up with time management? Well, asking yourself some of these questions, right, that are going to sort of lead you to, okay, well, maybe where is it that I tend to sort of overwork or I kind of avoid working? When is it that I'm overly focused on the details or overlook the small things? Um, are there uncomfortable emotions that I'm kind of avoiding that's making things take a really long time or actually I'm not really spending enough time on so I'm kind of rushing through. So thinking about some of these struggles um, and addressing our overall well being um, and our mental health needs and our physical care can support us in time management as well as these concrete plans that we're going to sort of see again and again, right, um, of the breaks and the rewards, um, giving ourselves rewards and setting small goals and using apps. When it comes to sort of managing distractions and hyper-focus, which means getting so invested in the details that you're taking a really long time on something where maybe it doesn't need to um, be that long, um, thinking about when is it that you engage in activities where you tend to hyper focus right do you tend to start something and you get so involved that it's eight hours later and you look up and you haven't been to the bathroom. Okay, well, I know that that takes a really long time. So, um, maybe that means um, I need to save this for a particular time and place. Uh, when it comes to distractions, I think it's really helpful to just keep a pad of paper or your cell phone by you so that when you're like, oh, I should do this other thing, maybe you have a running list of the other things that you want to do so that you're not getting distracted. When it comes to self monitoring, and this can be a tricky one, the next two slides I recommend taking a look at, you can print them out. How am I doing? These are checking in questions. So one of the executive functions is saying, how am I doing with planning? How am I doing with organization? How am I doing with prioritizing? Really taking a look and seeing like, how are things going? So how am I feeling? Where are my stress points? Do I have yardsticks that I wanna to achieve to sort of determine how much progress I'm making? Um, how much do I want to accomplish? Is that realistic? What are the pros and cons of how I'm handling things right now? How can I check in with myself on a regular basis? What do I do if a problem comes up? Who's my support system and how can I use it? Right, so thinking about all of these things, am I getting feedback? Is the feedback helpful? Thinking about all of these things can be a really useful way to sort of monitor and then make changes and be flexible. Throughout all of this, um, including self-monitoring, is taking care of ourselves, right? So we need to monitor that we're taking care of ourselves. These six um, self-care tools I find really useful. They actually come from the ACEs study um, from um, protective factors for childhood traumatic stress, but I think that they're really, really useful um, in managing our wellness and our self-care overall. So am I sleeping? Am I exercising? How's my nutrition? Am I using mindfulness? Do I am I using my healthy relationships? And am I taking care of my mental health? And I think this is a really good self-monitoring tool about like general wellness. So just to reiterate and to close up, we want to bolster our executive functioning skills from a holistic standpoint, right? We want to use apps and we want to use reminders and create lists and do all of those sort of concrete, I will call them like concrete skills, but we want to take care of ourselves. We want to be compassionate, right? We want to think about our overall being, our overall wellness, our overall cognitive load, our emotions, our self-care. Executive functioning is more than setting timers. <laughs> Um, and using lists, right? That's a part of it, um, but it's about our whole selves. So if there are, if you're sort of listening to this and you're thinking, oh, I could really use a little bit more support with this, or I'm trying some of these tools and it doesn't really feel like it's working for me, there are safe and effective ways to get professional help. So their executive functioning coaches will, will help you, who will help you make plans, will help you make calendars, will help you, you know, create organization systems that work for you. And there's also therapists who specialize um, in sort of supporting obviously your whole being and also who have understanding of executive functioning skills. And this I think can be really useful. And I really wanna highlight that this is a safe, supportive, non-judgmental, confidential environment. 
think a lot of times with executive functioning skills, like I said, we can be pretty hard on ourselves and it can feel anger making when we don't follow our systems. It can feel shameful or embarrassing when we're not doing the things that we feel like, okay, well, I don't understand everyone else can do X, Y, and Z. Why can't I just tend to, you know, get things organized or finish before midnight or um, know where my stuff is on my bench. Um, so I think oftentimes in therapy, it's really nice to have that confidential space to talk through some of these things um, in this non-judgmental and confidential environment. There's also, you know, tailored medication. Um, if you talk to your primary care physician or a psychiatrist and are talking about these things, it's important to also know that there is medication that is available to help and um, that is something to talk with your physician about. There's some resources, some books, um, and um, also a lot of the other, in the slides you'll see a lot of the other resources that um, I've listed um, for finding therapists as well as um, the rest of the talks that we gave and um, the YouTube channel. So thank you so much. Hey, Lori, thank you so much. There are a lot of questions and I'll try to run through some of them, but before I do that, um, I just want to remind people that we'll uh, take a short break and then we will pick up with small group discussions. Some of the things in the Q&A really beg a discussion, right? People sharing what's worked for them. And so I hope people uh, will find the time to stay. So in general, the questions to me, they feel like a push and a pull between two things. Uh, one what will work or what has worked for some people? What should I try? Uh, and then there's this other side of, you know, the world's a really tough place right now. So much is going on. How could I even think to function at a high level? Uh, I have such imposter fears and so much stress around my work. How could I think to function at a high level? Um, I have high expectations. My boss has high expectations and that's just overwhelming. And I wonder, I, you know, I know you said that they, they play into each other and we really need to see this dance. But to people who just feel like there's no way forward given all of the stressors, what are the first small things that people can do that might be helpful? I think anytime we're feeling really stuck is a way that you're describing it, that we're feeling really stuck, it's important to reach out to people that you trust. So small steps, whether it's a friend that you trust or um, an advisor on your institution that you trust, or um, if you have a mental health provider or a family member, small steps is to just reach out to come to small groups um, like this. When we're feeling really stuck, it is often very hard to see which way to turn. And we often can see that for others much easier than we can see it for ourselves. So asking someone, hey, do you mind can we just talk about this or oh, this is really stressing me out. Do you have a few minutes? I think reaching out and, you know, if something else you can do, if you're feeling like I'm not sure that this is something I can reach out to anyone about at the moment is to take some time and do some journaling. Just write what you're feeling stuck about. Um, check in on um, your frustrations, check in on your emotions. I think oftentimes through journaling, through meditating and for reaching out for help, these are small steps to start to start to get a picture of what are my pathways, right? Because when we're feeling like we don't have pathways, we have to sort of re regulate ourselves by ourselves and with the help of others so we can find our pathways. Going back, thinking about the first in the in the series we talked about sort of cultural views, we had a panel and one of the panelists said, one of the things that holds us all back is we tried once and it didn't work out well. That person wasn't as available as we had hoped or in fact, they were unhelpful, right? Even worse than sort of dismissing us. And so we get a message not to try. I get a sense from what you said 
that A, we need to keep trying till we find the right people, but B, it might be different things. Like uh, listening to you, I was thinking, oh, well, that's my morning walk, right? When I'm totally overwhelmed, that's when I can't miss that walk. And that it might be different things for different people. Um, and so we all need to sort of identify our go-to most helpful calming strategy. Would that, does that make sense or? Yeah, absolutely. I think when we think about feeling stuck, often it's a, we're in a bottom down moment or bottom up moment, right? Our amygdala is taken over. So to get ourselves to a place where we can sort of start to use that more creative, more flexible thinking, we have to restore our, our top down functioning. So those, those, um, that relax and distract slide that yeah. is going to be really helpful. That's maybe the important one. So again, a balance and a push pull. Um, you know, you talked about self compassion as sort of a primary. Right. If if we want to find a way through and and strengthen our emotional regulation and our executive function skills, we're going to have to be uh, aware of the principles of self compassion. But then uh, we have to balance that with the reality that we have to be productive at work. And I, you know, again, I know there's no right one answer, but can you sort of address how we navigate the fact that they feel uncoupled, right? Right. I appreciate you saying that they feel uncoupled, right? Because I think that that's a false dichotomy to say you have to be self-compassionate and you have to be productive. I actually think people who are productive tend to be self-compassionate, right? Because self-compassion is not saying, okay, you totally get to let yourself off the hook. You don't have to do anything. Don't worry about it. Self-compassion is, this is really hard and I can try anyways. And if I make a mistake, that's okay. Self-compassion is if I just do a tiny bit today and I get started, it's better than not getting started at all, right? Rather than I can't make a mistake so I can't get started, right? Self-compassion is um, motivating. It's encouragement, right? Rather than being really harsh, because I think we have the false idea that being incredibly harsh on ourselves and coming down hard on ourselves is the thing that makes us work hard. Maybe, but oftentimes in the long run, that's the thing that holds us back. It makes us be avoidant. It makes us not want to try. It makes us not want to take risks. Self-compassion is the thing that says, you know what? You can give it a shot and it's okay if it doesn't work out because you have resources to figure out how to get back from that. So I do think the people who are self-compassionate actually tend to be more productive. Thank you. Can you address a little bit, and I appreciate this is probably very nuanced for each individual, but a little bit the interplay of executive function and ADD and ADHD and other types of neurodiversity and how does one decide um, how, how to get in uh, and, and find strategies in, in the face of sort of this set of diagnoses or concerns. Right. So when you're facing this, oftentimes, right, if you've got a diagnosis, that usually means that there's a team around you, right, that at least there was a diagnostician, if not an ongoing mental health provider or a mental health team. So I do think it's probably pretty specialized for each person, but I think acknowledging like, listen, this is my neurodiversity and these are where my challenges are, starting to think about where are my needs? Wait, what are my needs based on my neurodiversity, based on my diagnosis? What are the things that I need to do to sort of say, okay, these are the strategies that help me meet those needs? And what is it about external support that you need? How can you start to sort of ask for that help and ask for that support? And it's so contextual and so nuanced for each person because there are environments where asking for support is gonna be met with um, support and there's environments where it's not going to be met with support. And so it's incredibly nuanced and contextual for each person, but I sort of wanna circle back to that. If there's a team, then using that team to sort of help you determine sort of what my specific needs are. How do I meet some of my needs? How do I ask for help with some of my needs? Thank you. Um, a lot of questions about what app 
uh, might work. Somebody who pointed out apps aren't helpful, and you know, I would I like to print things out. That's been disrupted a little by the pandemic, but a lot of discussion of this might help, might not help. What should I try? Can you give just a sense? So we try something once, right? That's right. We all know ends of one experiments aren't very valid, but how do you suggest that people look at trying different things so that it's not overwhelming, right? You're just trying so many different things at one time that you can't make sense of it. Like what's a structure that you recommend? I would say pick one executive functioning skill or one thing that's troubling you. I would use the problem solving process, right? You can take that problem solving process. What is the issue? Sort of see if you can drill it down to a detail. What are my options? What are my pathways, right? So really sort of drilling it down to one thing. So if it's, for example, if you're really struggling with time management and you find yourself in lab until midnight every night and everyone else seems to be going home before you and you're like, I just am not getting things done. Well, sort of starting with, okay, I need to be able to leave the lab, um, you know, an hour earlier than I am right now, rather than saying like, I'm gonna leave at five, right? Okay, if I'm leaving at midnight every night, I want to leave at 11. So what am I doing in my day? Are there parts of my day that um, can be shrunk down or are there parts that can be done the next day? If it's planning, picking um, a time in the morning to plan. So I guess what I'm saying is pick one thing, find one issue. Instead of saying, I'm going to overhaul everything, I'm going to be the best planner, prioritizer, time manager, pick one thing, one issue, find a couple of pathways and try those pathways and give it some time because nothing changes, right? Change is usually not very quick, right? It takes some time. It takes some sustained energy and use those self-monitoring tools to be like, is after a couple of weeks, is this working? And if it's not, trying something different, but really not trying to overhaul everything at once. So smaller changes, giving some time. I'm going to end just with um, uh, echoing a sentiment in many of the questions that supervisors play a really important role here. And that, of course, when supervisors model uh, healthy boundaries and well-being within their group or office, obviously, that makes it so much easier for everyone in the group. Um, and some of you know, some of that is tied to the assertiveness piece, which of everything that I heard today is sort of in the back of my mind spinning around. Um, do you have specific thoughts about how people can tackle some of this with supervisors? And I know, again, it's context specific, but just sort of some basic things to consider. Yeah, I would say, it, like you said, it's context specific. I would say starting a conversation so much of this has to do with communication so if you are in a place with your supervisor where you feel that it's safe to start a to start a line of communication making sure that first of all you feel safe but hey i listened to this executive functioning talk it was really interesting do you think we could talk about it a little bit together or do you think we could have a lab meeting dedicated to it um or um is this something that you know, I've been thinking about it and I'm, I really want to work on my X, my prioritizing my planning. Is this something that we could work on together um, to make sure that I'm on the right track? That's, you know, if you feel safe with your supervisor to start having those communication, but a lot of this comes down to sort of communicating. Um, and you can even say, hey, listen, like, is this something that um, we can work on more formally? I want to make sure that I'm, I know that this is a skill that's really important. If you're not feeling safe, then um, going to other uh, people at your institution who can sort of help you make a plan so you don't have to do it alone. Yeah, of course, ideally, it would be a conversation that everyone could have with their supervisor, but we need to acknowledge that we uh, aren't at that ideal yet and that we have a lot of work to do to get there. Um, but there are uh, supporters at every institution and there are uh, it's really important, I, I think, maybe to start there. 
The small group discussions will uh, start at 4.15. That gives everybody a chance to uh, stretch for a moment. If you can come early, it, it helps us sort out room numbers and make sure that the breakout rooms go really smoothly. In addition to the program today, there will be two follow-up things that you are invited to. I don't remember what the topics are, but they are both related to um, executive function. And um, uh, we will get the email out as soon as we can. In addition, Lori, can you bring that slide back up so I can see the uh, Zoom room number and everyone can get it? So, so many of the questions really related to, I would like to hear from others. And while Lori um, led us through a really helpful overview, the learning really happens uh, in the small groups. So meeting ID is 1609227764. Uh, jot it down because once we close this room, you won't be able uh, to get there. And so we'll leave this up for a moment. Uh, as everybody uh, migrates off into the other room. Thank you very much, Lori. Really uh, learned a lot and appreciate your time.